So I want to just uh, welcome everybody and uh, thanks to everyone um, attending our webinar today. I think you'll find today's webinar uh, quite interesting. Uh, it's uh, part of a series of webinars and seminars uh, that 360 Energy is presenting um, to keep corporate leaders objectively informed of the many changes, um, including risks and opportunities occurring uh, in the energy industry. Uh, as far as 360 Energy goes, we've been around since uh, 1995. Um, our goal is to deliver continuous improvement uh, for our customers by embedding energy management practices um, and, you know, looking at uh, energy, measuring energy, energy costs and proving to those companies and con encouraging the fact that those are controllable things. Um, we primarily work in two areas, which are advising customers how to optimize their energy procurement, reducing operating costs, mitigating future risks, and reducing greenhouse gases, um, and also working with organizations to reduce their utility consumption, which includes electricity, natural gas, diesel, and uh, water. So the backbone of 360 Energy Solutions is capturing and reporting energy data and using this information to help the business manage the two items uh, that we kind of mentioned. Um, so David Lazell is our, um, our uh, presenter today. Uh, he's the co-founder and research director with the Transition Accelerator and the executive director of the Canadian Energy Systems Analysis Research um, Group, so CSER. He began his academic career as a professor of biology at Queen's University um, and has since generated an international reputation. He was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and uh, over the past 20 plus years his interdisciplinary uh, research efforts have focused on exploring and defining transition pathways capable of moving Canada to a more sustainable future. Um, so without any further ado, I'm going to hand this over to David. Uh, just uh, before we do that, though, I just wanted to kind of let everybody know we do have um, a chat function in um, on our presentation today. I would encourage, um, just because we've got everybody muted right now, just to kind of cut down on background noise, we find that's usually the easiest way to, to do that. Um, so if you do have some questions, we'll be monitoring the chat function, and I'll be able to ask uh, David those questions. Um, if it's a question particularly pertinent to um, what we're talking about at the time or what David's talking about at the time, I might interject, uh, but for the large part, we're going to be having a little bit of a Q&A at the end, so stay tuned uh, for that as well. So without any further ado, I'll uh, let David uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much. It's a, a pleasure to, again to, uh, to talk to the uh, 360 Energy Group. Um, this talk is the last one I gave was more on the hydrogen economy is really about the work that we have been doing within the uh, Caesar uh, and as part of the transition accelerator. This one is it touches on some work that we've done, but it's more about yeah, this is more really wearing my hat as a uh, on the in the transition accelerator as a research director to identify this is a, an area which we see as being uh, really a, one of the major drivers for transformative change within uh, North American uh, in global uh, transportation and has huge implications on the future of our energy systems and certainly more work is needed. So in some ways this is much about trying to define a perspective and, and soliciting hopefully interest from companies and from other academics that uh, might be interested in working in this space and, uh, and maybe there's an opportunity for the Transition Accelerator to help uh, support to work that would actually explore how do we take the, uh, the movement to autonomous vehicles and how do we direct that disruptive change in order to ensure that it's uh, for the benefit of society. So in the presentation today, I've got, uh, I really wanna talk about five things. I wanna start with the net zero emission challenge, go on and talk about personal mobility and some of the challenges it has, and you'll understand that, that linkage in a second look at some of the forces for transformative change and uh, obviously that are that are happening in this space of personal mobility. Do a, make a comment. At the end, I would like to just touch on some work that, that we've been doing uh, with a lot of interest from the real estate sector on the implications of this technology. You say, well, what does this have to do with real estate? The movement to a, a autonomous vehicles could have a huge impact on our on the design of our cities and on the real estate sector. So I'd like to point to some of that and then end with some conclusions and and, and hopefully some discussion, uh, because I, I think this is one of those 
transformative uh, part of a transformative change, which I think is is going to hit more than just the transportation sector and personal mobility sector. So to begin, uh, we do have a we have a country. Canada has committed to net zero emissions by 2050. That would put us on a transition uh, on a change in our emissions that looks something like the yellow line in this chart, uh, where we're looking at emission reductions that are are far in excess of the of the commitments that we've already made and not achieved, uh, like the Kyoto commitment, which is a 10 million ton a year, Copenhagen 7.3 million ton a year reduction. We're now looking at 16 to 25 million ton a year. So this is really transformative changes. Uh, this is these you know the the concept of net zero. We assume is is really a, partly emission reductions and partly carbon removal or net you know car carbon removal technologies, but but still transformational changes are needed here. Um, one of the problems, though, and I think we all realize this, is that for many, perhaps most Canadians, don't really see climate change in itself as sufficiently compelling reason to make major changes in their in their way of life, uh, and especially, of course, if there's a perceived cost. And so, what we step back, and this is the whole philosophy behind the transition accelerator about Caesar's work is that really maybe the climate change problem just really isn't big enough uh, that you know that maybe we have to put other things on the table in fact we have many precedents for doing this any international trade agreements uh, you know if you can't get a agreement on on sort of milk marketing boards or whatever then we put uh, aluminum and steel on the table whatever there's collective bargaining of course uh, uh, convincing your teenager to you know clean up their bedroom or something um th these are all that you put other things on the table so so what we're arguing is that maybe we need to expand the problem space when we're actually looking at solutions for climate change to include issues that are compelling to canadians and will drive transformative change uh issues like more convenience lower costs greater comfort improved health uh higher quality of life those are the things that drive transformative change uh, within our our systems, and and what we need to do is uh, effectively then harness those changes in, in order to and ensure we embed in them uh, movement to a low carbon economy and and other societal benefits that are that are quite important. We can use uh, one of the classic examples of this kind of an argument is the personal mobility case. It's a, this is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. Personal mobility contributes about 13% of our emissions uh, from the tailpipe of the vehicles, uh, plus emissions from the fuel production. And that in, in, our, in our, um, most of our um, fuels, it's really talking about another 5% approximately. Uh, another 5% of Canadian emissions can be tied directly to the upstream production of the fuels. Um, that's not counting the uh, the transport fuels that, especially in Alberta, that we make and export to other countries who are consumed in other other countries. The, the reality is, is this personal mobility sector has more problems than just greenhouse gas emissions. And, and the reality is, is we would argue that solutions to those problems may be actually much more compelling, compelling drivers for transformative change. So if we're actually looking at trying to change the personal mobility sector in order to address climate change. It would be crazy to make changes to the personal mobility sector of 2015. We should be making changes to the personal mobility sector of 2030 and 2035. So we got to embed, it, we have to be aware of these other disruptive forces, these other challenges and problems within the personal mobility sector, and, and, and design our climate change strategies uh, to to engage those and encompass those, and I think this is a this is like more and more governments are recognizing that solving the climate change problem and directing policies to address greenhouse gas emissions really have to uh, put other things on the table. So some of the problems with personal mobility that are in addition to the greenhouse gas problem I've already talked about. Obviously, accidents are a serious problem. Ninety four percent of the accidents in the sector is caused by human error. In Canada, it's something in the range of up to 2,000 fatalities per year and 10,000 serious injuries per year. As fortunately, these are coming down. This number is coming down every year. This is uh, with with uh, new sensors on vehicles and uh, and uh, you know vehicles that are safer. But still, in 2007, the Conference Board of Canada actually came out a report, which I think is a bit high a number, but it's a they claimed a societal cost of about $62 billion 
uh, or the equivalent of about almost 5% of our GDP as the cost of accidents in Canada. Uh, congestion is another problem, and all of us uh, who live in near cities are, are, are facing this. 11.4 um, million Canadians commute an average of 24 minutes, uh, you know, two and 24 minutes from work every day. Uh, that adds up, you know, where if you consider that for 240 days a year, that means for every single day that we're going to work to 240, it's about 4,700 person years of time is spent in rather unproductive time. Now, some of us actually find some productivity of time and sitting in a traffic jam, you know, you get to think about things or whatever, listen to the music, but it's, you know, maybe there's things that would be more fun to do and many of us uh, who get stuck in traffic jams. Uh, and the congestion would think. In, indeed, in th that there's uh, better ways to spend our time. Rethink X, which is a, uh, a US think tank, uh, has estimated that in the United States, uh, commuting reduces the GDP in, uh, by about $1 trillion a year. So certainly it's not, it's not $0, uh, but you know, we're, we're talking a significant uh, cost. Air pollution is, a, is another cost. Uh, ground level ozone on particulate matter, mostly from vehicles, this has been estimated in this study report that I quoted here, about $36 billion a year in health costs uh, associated with air pollution. Um, value for money, and this is the one that really strikes you. When you figure, you know, as Canadians, each household spent about 18% of the total distributed uh, income of a household. A household, uh, uh, you know, uh, expendable expenses are going to, uh, light personal light duty vehicles. Uh, this is shown in the chart on the right. In Alberta, we tend to buy bigger cars and drive longer distances and spend more money, but on, on vehicles, we're close to about $14,000 a year in Alberta, about $11,000 a year in Canada. And yet, for that's what these vehicles cost us, but we only use them about 4% of the time. And then even when we do use them, there's typically only one and a half persons per vehicle when there are actually seats for five or seven. So these are probably one of the poorest used assets when you actually look at uh, at all of the things we do. It's, it's uh, you know the second most important invent, uh, investment we make in our lives often for most people and uh, uh, next to our houses, but uh, they're no, it's not a well-used investment. But of course we need it because this is the way our system works. You can notice on the chart here on the right that the actual purchase of the vehicle is about half of the overall total cost of the vehicle, we got then registration, insurance, and licenses, and maintenance of it. There's the fuel cost in yellow there, and parking costs at the top. Uh, so this, you know, this this is a, a major investment, uh, and one could argue that uh, the value for money isn't uh, isn't here. We, but it's the only option we have at the present time. Then we actually step back and look at what are implications on our cities, our personal mobility system. Uh, huge impacts on parking, on urban form, and on taxes. I mean, par cars are parked about 96, 95, 96% of the time, and they're typically parked on in our cities where we work in the most valuable land in Canada. Um, it also encourages urban sprawl, as you can see in this picture. Uh, our cities become really car friendly, not very people friendly, and you know that has other societal problems. And by the way, this whole infrastructure is highly subsidized. If you look at all the gas taxes and licensing fees and the fines, et cetera, uh, studies have been done, especially in Ontario, where there's some quite detailed studies have been done on this. It's, it's somewhere between 50 to 70% of the overall cost of the infrastructure. The rest of the cost comes out of our sales taxes and uh, uh, you know, uh, income taxes, et cetera. So it puts a burden on our, our rest of society. So again, if you know, we're trying to, if you're going to fix personal mobility, you got to recognize that there's all of these problems. So now what are the forces? You know, I mean, we've recognized we have a greenhouse gas problem. We got all the problems I've just talked about. There are some pretty uh, significant transformative uh, in innovations of, of technology, social innovations, and, uh, and business model innovations that are coming to play now. One of the two, you know, some of the compelling disruptive innovations is, is the combination of connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles. Now, by connected vehicles, these are vehicles with sensors and, and, and inter-vehicle intercommunications that are, can be really classified in three types. V to V is vehicle to vehicle. So one uh, car is driving down the road now can, and, and what's being designed now, and there's tons of work being done, and we'll show you some of the investments in this area, where vehicles will send out signals to all other vehicles within 
uh, you know, um, tens of meters of themselves that says, I'm a vehicle moving in this direction, in this speed. I have no intention of changing lanes. Uh, basically, I'm not, I don't have my signals on. Uh, I'm traveling at this speed and, you know, this is where I'm going. And that can tell other vehicles. And in fact, it allows vehicle to vehicle communication would allow two vehicles to platoon one behind another. So essentially come very close together and essentially the, um, the speed of the vehicle and whether it's accelerating or decelerating is determined by the lead vehicle and all the other vehicles behind are, are more or less in tune with it. And, uh, and this allows much more efficient use of roadways uh, and, 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 a, and a speeding up traffic movement. Vehicle to, uh, infrastructure is also, you know, you can see a platoon of vehicles going down and talking to a street light and saying, look at, I'm going to, we're going to 20 vehicle platoon here is going to be at your street light in, in 17 seconds. Um, you know, can you keep the light green to get us all through? And we're really going to help in the traffic flow for might be another four or five seconds to keep the light green. And then all of the vehicles are through at fairly high speed. So we can actually, you, you can actually have vehicle to vehicle communications that vehicle infrastructure and of course vehicle to web if there's an accident or construction rerouting uh, traffic which is already happening in our in our um, uh, google maps programs we put autonomous vehicles um, really take it to a, a new level they, they're often connected and typically connected and autonomous and when you actually think about how this is 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 starting to be deployed uh, there are both pros and cons on the pro side there's a real possibility here for accident reduction. Uh, estimates are 80% of the accidents, or not even 90% of the accidents could that occur could be, uh, you know, could be reduced here. It could save uh, more than 1,400 lives per year. The very conservative number in Canada or more. Also reduce injury, vehicle damage, it's reduction, which is there's a lot of our uh, investment, dollar investment in, in in energy and greenhouse gas investments in building vehicles that would be saved as well. On the other side, we're looking with uh, autonomous vehicles, there's a lot more demand. Um, uh, possibility of uh, autonomous vehicles competing with public transit and basically instead of public transit, you'd take your own, much more convenient, take your take a vehicle and uh, have it just drop you off and then uh, and you don't have to worry about parking. A vehicle drives away. Um, there's a possibility of the vehicle driving away empty, of course, and now we have you know, people maybe don't wanna, wanna go to work, they get dropped off down, you know, at their office. They don't wanna pay the parking, you know, in Calgary it's 20 or 30 bucks a day for parking. They don't wanna pay, they just tell their vehicle to drive back home and park in the garage and then come back and get them in the, mor in the evening. Um, if that happens, you'd have uh, basically traffic jams in both directions, congestion downtown with full vehicles and congestion going back with empty vehicles, uh, congestion and, uh, and you know that that is actually a very real possibility depending on how we deploy a uh, longer commute is another issue uh, you know vehicles that uh, autonomous vehicles reduce the opportunity cost if you like is a terminology for for spending a lot of time in a car because you could actually the vehicle's driving itself you could be on the phone you could be do, catching up on your email so a lot more tendency to people live and cause more irritants for all people live outside of the cities more and, and have longer commutes on a pro side, it's a, a more efficient use of the roads. On the negative side, especially if these are gasoline vehicles, more greenhouse gases, more air pollution. Uh, on the pro side, platooning and better traffic management. On the con side, more congestion due to the things we've talked about before. More convenience on the pro side, higher vehicle cost on the con side. You can do it. There are other, mo more, there are other pros and cons that are possible here. So if we look at then what are some other uh, innovations, and we could also add to connected and autonomous vehicles and say, well, there's also this uh, car sharing, a car to go is one example, Uber is another of kind of shared vehicles. Uh, and there's also electric vehicles and the, and the movement to electrification, both as battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. And, you know, when one of these, each of these are now of uh, four areas are operating independently, um, but there's a real movement it, within the whole sector of converging all four of these technologies, autonomous, connected, shared, and electric vehicles, that, um, and especially the first three of those, autonomous, connected, and shared vehicles, that would converge to create a whole new business model for personal mobility, uh, which has been called to various things. Sometimes you hear it called mobility as a service, sometimes transportation as a service, but those terms are often used for things like Uber and uh, some of the existing technologies. The one that is really 
that the, the terminology that I think is more precise is autonomous mobility on demand. And these would be vehicles that uh, would uh, be able to drive on their own. They could come, you know, in response to a cell phone and come and pick you up uh, at a pickup location, uh, wherever you are, just comes to you, picks you up, uh, takes you to where you want to go, drops you off, and then goes and, and does a pickup drop off for somebody else. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a taxi service without a taxi driver. Uh, this, there's a, a lot of interest in that technology and a lot of implications for it. And so one of the things I wanted to just review a paper that was published a few years ago that actually looks at some of the, the major trends in the autonomous vehicle and energy use. We talked a bit about platooning, where these vehicles um, can, you know, uh, can, can travel very close to one another uh, without the risk of them hitting one another because they're all having millisecond uh, communications with one another. And if uh, one puts on the brakes, they all put on the brakes and, and together and they slow down together or they speed up together and we have a much more efficient use of our road space. Um, and so that's, that would actually cause, so in this chart, what I'm gonna be doing is going through and showing what are the implications on then energy consumption due to vehicle automation. There's an estimate that this could reduce energy consumption by as much as 20% or more uh, with a platooning. There's also a possibility of eco-driving because these are autonomous vehicles. Um, the rates of acceleration and deceleration are not determined by you know, maybe the testosterone level of the driver, because, you know, you've got a, it's basically determined by software and there would be a, you know, be a more of an optimized, uh, more equal driving. Uh, and, and there's an estimate that that would again, reduce somebody in the 20% range uh, of, um, in, in the 20% of, of what would be our, from our existing system. Congestion mitigation could reduce by 5% or so with the vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to infrastructure and vehicle to web. Uh, communication, more efficient movement. Um, these vehicles could have a smaller engines, um, partly because they don't need the rate of acceleration and deceleration they might require. Uh, the platooning means that they could, you know, jump behind another vehicle and get more. So the possibility of smaller engine technology uh, with a de-emphasis on, on performance. And certainly if uh, what I've done here is put the S word in here, because if these, if, if they're shared, there's a real there's a way to enhance this and get even greater benefits because you're basically uh, the, the sharing option uh, would would allow that you know that that essentially a, a corporation might own the fleet of vehicles and uh, people wouldn't have personal ownership and the vehicles would be uh, provided as a vehicle service rather than than uh, somebody buying a a vehicle um, you know where they have a very hot vehicle for the one day in a year that they want to do drag racing or whatever that you know that that happens um in, in our current ways of buying of buying vehicles we buy a certain a lot of the features on the vehicles we buy is not the ones that we're going to use every day they're the ones that we might use because there's one day a year we want to pull a trailer or something of that sort um there's a crash avoidance which again could read uh, certainly would reduce greenhouse gas emissions because of the repair costs etc um, the, one of the very big ones here is right sizing of vehicles. If we went to an autonomous shared vehicles, there's a possibility of having, you know, most of our trips are one person trips or two person trips. Mm -hmm. So one possibility is when you order a vehicle to come and pick you up, um, you could order a, a one person or a two person vehicle. It's, you know, you don't need a, a six person minivan to, you know, to go commuting to a commute or even to pick up your groceries or something. You, you know, this, most of our trips could be done with, um, with smaller vehicles. And so right sizing vehicles can be done in fleets. This is estimated to reduce by emissions up from 20 to 50% reduction in emissions. But one of the challenges of these autonomous vehicles, because it's safer, that we could have increased, significantly increased speed on our highways to, to faster and in the, Opening slide I showed, you know, out the window you could see a 240 kilometer an hour uh, a speed sign on the roads, you know, because you know, with with autonomous vehicles you could actually ha have a much higher speed rates and much lower commute dis uh, commute times on on inner city highways, for example. Other features is that you know when you start having autonomous vehicles, you start thinking that oh, there's going to be other things in the vehicle, you know, a, a, a TV, a internet uh, capability, a fridge to hold a, a beer, so in your way home from work you can have a beer. Um, those are those are possibilities that will be uh, certainly being looked at uh, and considered as looking at autonomous vehicle futures. Uh, they were going to increase the energy cost. The travel cost reduction is a big one. Um, 
this is because you know there's a the opportunity cost uh, you know is basically going to mean the cost of moving from A to B is going to be significantly reduced with uh, autonomous shared uh, vehicles, especially if they are electric as well. Uh, and and this is estimated that could cause an increase in energy demand by the whole sector by uh, fifty percent or more. Then we actually got new user groups coming on, um, groups that basically may be like the elderly or under age uh, that uh, diversion from public transit that would increase demand for per, for uh, personal vehicle movements uh, because these would be, the shared vehicle in particular would mean that you know you don't need a driver's license to to drive around uh, uh, you could you know uh, dropping your kids off to school could actually be done where a car comes up picks them up and drops them off at school where there's somebody at the school who is actually uh, knows the code to open the doors or whatever to to let the person out, and um, so there's a totally change in the way our our cities work. Change mobility services. Um, uh, you know, car sharing would reduce the number of vehicles and replace taxis. So there's this is thought in general, especially with right sizing, et cetera, to significantly reduce energy demand and the infrastructure footprint. A lot fewer parking lots. Because what do you need parking lots for if you're if there's a you know you're just being dropped off and picked up the car is going to go off and and stay on the roads because it's an expensive uh, piece of equipment and it's the idea is to keep it uh, keep it in operation not have it parked so those are the kinds these these are are um, changes uh, that are being envisaged and certainly being designed into American vehicles there's pros and 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 cons in terms of energy use so if this is with a mod which is the autonomous mobility on demand we can see the kind of suggestions of what this is going to be done and there's a body of literature on this in the academic literature this kind of summarizes kind of the the, the general direction we're looking at and we've tried to put some numbers in here for Canada um, our personal our vehicle ownership today is personal in an AMOD it would probably be a car service you maybe wouldn't own a car you wouldn't even have a car ownership in a family uh, you you could actually have a you could buy a car service that might give you, you know, 15,000 kilometers per year of uh, car service for so much a month. It's like a telephone service. Um, that would mean that instead of having 22 million personally owned vehicles in Canada, which what we have today, the number of vehicles would actually drop to maybe something in three to five million. But each vehicle, instead of driving about 16,000 kilometers per year, which is what we have today, we'd be talking about 140,000 kilometers per year. Um, the vehicles, instead of, you know, 5% vehicles, just about 1.2 hours per day, these vehicles would be on the road 10, 12, 14 hours or more. Uh, it could be much higher than 140,000 kilometers a year. In fact, in some of the models that have been done, you know, some of these vehicles would just start running at 6 in the morning, taking people to, the, to rev, dropping them off at the office, going out, doing, you know, inter, moving people around the city all day, and, and then to the pub at night and back home. So the, you could imagine vehicles being using 16, 18 hours a day. A vehicle lifetime, instead of lasting 15 years or more, six to eight years is considered the outside top end. And indeed, with technology changing so fast, it, and with you know going to so 200,000 kilometers a year potentially, um, it could only be four years or five years, and and then the, the vehicles will be be replaced quite often. Uh, but the the lifetime in kilometers is more than a you know, typically now it's about $220,000 for the whole life of the vehicle. It's a million kilometers or more. That kind of a change in the demand on the vehicle really means um, moving away from gasoline vehicles and the economics of it. In a, in a vehicles like these, the actual fuel cost is much more expensive. As you saw in the charts previously, the fuel cost and the overall total cost of ownership is actually a relatively small component on, in the way we use our vehicles today. But in autonomous mobility on demand, the fuel cost is a very large component. And in fact, going to electric uh, vehicles is, uh, you know, has a, has a real benefit of electric, either battery electric or hydrogen fuel cell electric. Uh, and a lot of this is, you know, part of the issue is, you know, these will be centrally owned and maintained car service. So you would have, uh, you know, every, you'd have a, a refueling station where they'd also clean the vehicles and get them ready uh, to go back on the road. Uh, when the when the you know to make sure they're always on the road during rush hour, but you know between rush hour they can come off and get recharged and and uh, and cleaned. Accidents and deaths probably uh, eighty to ninety percent reduction there. The cost estimate is instead of you know ten twelve thousand dollars a year, thirteen thousand dollars a year per family or per per household, 
Um, a fairly high estimate is about six thousand dollars per year. That would be the cost of a of a car service. And the car companies that are building these cars would make a lot more money than they do today. Uh, you're going to see that by the investments that have been happening in this sector. But uh, if the 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 estimate is is by 2030, 2035, this will be the biggest boost. If you ask, think you've got, you know, how many, what, 15 million families in Canada or home unit or household units, maybe 20 million, everyone saves on average $6,000 per year savings. That That's a huge boost in after-tax uh, disposable income. Uh, parking needs goes from high to low. We'll talk more about parking a bit later. So um, this is kind of, this is a study from McKinsey Group looking at investments uh, and what's happening in investments from um, 2010 through to 2017. And what you really want to know is, it's not going into this in a lot of detail, but the big ones that have really changed. Here's the investments in billions of dollars uh, from 2010 to 2013 period, the small to very large circles in the ones at the bottom here. It's on sharing solutions, autonomous solutions, user interface technologies and that's software and and sensors and semiconductors that are that are allowing these vehicles anybody who's you know rented a vehicle or bought a vehicle in the recent years you know that they come off a lot more bells and whistles on them now than they did before uh, we're very much on this transition pathway to autonomous vehicles and uh and and sharing solutions uh that projection in this rethink x report that uh, was, was published a couple of years ago. Um, basically, they are predicting that here we are in 2020. They're basically saying in 2021, 2020, I think this is a little bit aggressive, but I certainly uh, I see, understand what they're saying is that as they bring on more and more AMODs, the orange one here, this is the number of vehicles. So these are the number of passenger vehicles in the United States that where one vehicle, one AMOD vehicle or autonomous mobility on demand would replace perhaps eight, even as many as 10 personally owned vehicles, because essentially it's providing the, the vehicle service. And even if the people still own the vehicle, they're not gonna use it. So they'll be stranded assets. And the set, what they're pr predicting and whether this is true or not, that the personally owned vehicles um, you know, of today, they're being bought today, will still be on the road 10 years from now or 15 years, 13 years from now, because that's how long they last. But in eight to 10 years from now, the, the vehicle you just bought last month will be a stranded asset. You won't be able to sell it because nobody's going to want it. There's, uh, you know, you'll, or you'll sell it for a very, very low price because the it's, it's a much lower cost to autonomous vehicle on demand. We actually see in Caesar and our analysis uh, is that it's probably a lot slower transition, especially in Canada. But we see the impacts of this will start to be seen. What the magnitude of it is, nobody knows. Uh, it's very hard to predict the future, but I think we do have an opportunity, as I've said many times, we have an opportunity to create a future. And so there's a question is, is in some case, what do we want to see? And how do we actually design our own policy and investment decisions and the public engagement in order to actually create a better energy future around the person mobility space. There's, this is kind of one, uh, one direction that it could go. It could have some positive effects, but it could also have some negative effects. What I'd like to do, and I'm, I'm almost finished here and we'll hopefully have some time for some questions, is really is take back and look at a, at a study that we've actually been doing within CSER. Uh, and, um, and this is a preliminary study. We're looking at the, the whole issue of what autonomous mobility as a service on parking demand. And really this is, is starting to understand, well, what's the role of parking in Canadian society today? So what we've done is, is, is done some work on quantifying how many parking stalls on the left chart here uh, we have and, and, and where they exist. So this is just the commercial and institutional parking. Um, some of this you pay for if you want to go, you know, parking downtown, you have to, you know, if you're into an office building or whatever, you have to pay. But a lot of this parking is provided free. It's actually embedded in the retail cost. If you want to go to a grocery store, they don't charge you for parking. You get free parking, but uh, but somebody's paying for it. And the real payment here is there's a six million stalls of retail there. Office parking is really like 10 or, you know, up to 10. Arts and recreation, healthcare, education, wholesale, accommodation, food. That's restaurants, et cetera, uh, it's other parking. The annual cost of this, and, and this, and this uh, is retail offices, you know, is in here, is in the range of a little over $30 billion. So it's about $30 billion a year. And this is, uh, includes 
the cost for the land, uh, the cost for the um, well, the construction of the parking and, or the parking lot or the parking facility and its maintenance. When we take these numbers and add um, residential parking on top, this is what we get. So the red numbers there are basically the same numbers that I just showed you for commercial institutional. Um, the actual the cost of parking, residential parking, the number of parking spots is even higher. Um, so in residential parking, we had the 30 million stalls here. Another perhaps, uh, you know, we have a total here of overall stalls is about, you know, coming on, um, what is the number here, about 47 million stalls or something. The overall cost here, you know, single family uh, residents, if you, a, a parking spot costs, you know, many tens of thousands of dollars in apartment buildings, it's, you know, 80,000, 70,000 to 100,000 bucks. In, in an underground parking in 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 a com in a multi uh, story multi unit apartment, um, the overall cost is about sixty nine billion dollars a year. The amortized cost, seven percent for maintenance and operation, fifty percent for construction, about forty three percent landfill. Now the thing is to think about this from an economy based and from what's going to drive transformational change in this space. Um, AMOD as a new business model for personal mobility could reduce parking demand by 80 to 90 percent uh just to, you know depending on there's certainly going to need to be parking for the amods because those try but there's going to be very dense and when you actually think about it if you're parking an autonomous vehicle you don't need very much space between the vehicles and the vehicles can park and unpark themselves uh they could be very close together because nobody has to get in or out of the doors you don't need space to doors you can cram a lot more vehicles in a parking spot. And indeed, there are lots of academic studies looking at what our parking spots are going to be look like in the future of autonomous cars. And it's a very how much higher density, almost twice the density of a parking lot. So what is the impact does this have on our cities and and on the future of our economy? Because what we want to do is to design transition pathways to a low carbon future. There's really about designing it for for where we're going to go, maybe where we want to go. Certainly our existing public parking facilities will need to be repurposed. And in fact, in Calgary and every other city, uh, when they're building, that I know about, is when they're building parking facilities now, you all the new ones no longer have sloped floors. They have flat floors and there's ramps going up because they, you know, most anybody who's in the parking business knows that this is coming and it's changing the actual design of the parking structures. Now they're often making uh, the space between the floors in an above ground parking facility are higher so that they can you can retrofit that building and and actually put a regular so, some of the old fashioned parking spots have very low ceilings um, now you're making them higher so that you could actually envisage that this structure could be used to make an apartment building or a store or whatever else so there's a secondary use possibilities of you know taking out parking lots in cities and making more parks or increasing building density in city centers 30 to 40 percent of downtown regions are often really attributed to parking, right? So if you actually look on, G on Google Maps and you look at the amount of parking, um, uh, it's you know it's a big chunk and there's a very it's very valuable land. Huge implications for laneway housing and even apart in, in garages and buildings and and certainly when we've been talking to the real estate sector, um, they're quite actually excited about this because they so much money costs to put in garages and things on on, on apartment buildings. They feel there's a much more flexibility if they weren't required. Or you know, or, or if they start building buildings where they don't have to account for cars, they can make uh, housing much cheaper. Um, we could envisage. Uh, I've had groups of students working on this project over the last five years or so on these areas, and most of them look at you know try to work through what the implications are. And you know, there's a, there's a sense that once a few people start switching and don't own cars and have um, a, they want to use autonomous vehicles. They will insist on right outside their front door that there's a PUDO, a pick up and drop off location. It's a the PUDO locations. And and they're going to start phoning up the city hall and say banning, I don't want people parking on the front of my house because I can't have a pick up drop off location anymore. And so the movement against street parking is something that probably estimate from our calculations, something between 10 to 20 percent uh, of the of the people on the street start moving to not even owning a car the uh it's kind of like secondhand smoking there's going to be an anti for people who do own cars right and and we know how society works this is possibly a direction it might might go newer design for residential communities uh, higher density but with parks walkability bike lanes pudos pick up drop off locations 
a uh, whole concept of Google, Google Sidewalk Labs, which has uh, without the Big Brother element there. Um, you know, these, these are these are new ways of thinking about urban design, and and I think this is going to happen in other cities as well, or it's actually happening already uh, around the world. Uh, relaxed demand for parking in new construction. This is uh, already that's happening. The city of Edmonton actually just announced that this is going to take out the demand for when you're building a new apartment building or something. Just reduce the demand. They used used to say, you know, for every apartment you have to have this many spots. For every uh, store has to put this many um, parking spots in which really uh, increases the cost of the building, but also uh, decreases the flexibility and, 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 and creates actually car-friendly, not people-friendly locations. Lower housing cost is something which um, certainly the real estate sector we've been talking to is very uh, interested in that. Uh, the whole concept of strip malls, right? Um, we're changing the structure of our city. The idea of you know gasoline alleys and strip malls uh, could, Totally, and obviously auto sales and service disappear because the the companies that make the cars will actually probably own the car service. You'll have a Tesla car service, you'll have a Ford car service, you'll have a Volkswagen car service, and you'll buy your car service from them and they'll pick up and drop you off. Uh, and if you want to be uh, fancier, you'll buy a Tesla car service or a, you know Cadillac car service or whatever. And if you want to be lower cost, you'll, you'll get something less. Um, large lots will be needed to service the vehicles and and large electricity demands in very concentrated areas so the whole idea of you know in terms of urban planning building out um, electric vehicle futures where we're planning on every garage in the city having electric charger because everybody's got electric vehicles is that really a is that really where we want to go or maybe what we're talking about is are we going to be moved to amod and um, where basic people don't own cars, we have more of a car service. Uh, and the people who do own cars, you know, they you can still have own a car, but you're gonna you're gonna pay more, uh, and you're gonna have more challenge uh, parking it. Um, one of the things that we're looking at, and this is where we we haven't done detailed analysis on it, but I'm trying to actually trigger because we would really like to start working with research groups across Canada wearing the transition accelerator hat to try to actually explore possibilities of of how do we direct disruption in this is a major disruptive area how do we direct disruption in order to to address societal needs we would argue that we maybe consider things like how do we encourage autonomous vehicle electrification and discourage internal combustion engine in autonomous vehicles because these vehicles are going to be driving around empty um, the last thing we want is greenhouse gas emissions from vehicles that are driving around empty. Let's have at least, well, maybe we could say, you want the economic benefits of autonomous and you want the luxury of that. You can't have autonomous if it's if it's a turtle combustion engine. That could be a policy that we just put in and basically say, you want an autonomous, fully autonomous vehicle, it has to be electric. Well, the other possibility is to really discourage privately owned autonomous vehicles and encourage shared autonomous vehicles. Another one is to, you know, is to make sure that we, and autonomous vehicles, the way it's deployed in cities, um, supports and extends public transit, doesn't actually undermine it. And this is, and what we have to really, really think, and we've actually been working with the city of Calgary on a bit on their, you know, what is the future of public transit in an autonomous vehicle world? Maybe we have to change it. You know, buses running around, maybe those we pick up, a, uh, you know, uh, the buses will be autonomous smaller cars that, or small buses that pick you up and bring you to. The uh, the train stations, the more the the more uh, public transit that takes you into the center of the city. Uh, so those are we have to think about. We have to be modeling and think about the kind of cities we want to live in the future. How do we solve uh, the problem of cities? And that's going to require research studies and and thinking ahead about how we deploy these disruptive technologies. Um, obviously, we want to you know we want to encourage pick up and drop off locations and discourage parking. Uh, encourage people-focused communities, discourage car-focused communities. And there's lots of ways of doing this. This is, I, sus I suspect what I'm saying here is controversial to some. They treasure their cars, they want it. Uh, part of it is, you know, we have to we have to build positive shared visions for pathways that are going to take us to a better future. I We would argue that we need to start having these conversations now. Uh, it's a lot easier to um, once you once you have disruptive change to mold something into something you want it to be, then having it resettle into something else and you figure, my God, this is worse than what we had before, and then undoing it is more expensive and more challenging. Um, final for discussion and conclusion, um, 
a lot of people say it's going to be a long time away. I guess I would like to to end my talk by just pointing out, taking us back 120 years ago, the really the start. Uh, about 100 years ago, 120 years ago, is the start of the last major transformation in the personal mobility sector. Here is uh, the Fifth Avenue uh, Easter Parade in the uh, year 1900. And you can see tons of horses and buggies here going, people walking on the street. There is one car on this slide. Here we go, 13 years later, same thing. Easter Parade, Fifth Avenue, New York, all you see is cars, there is one horse and buggy. We are, we are at the cusp and we're talking in, you know, Canada has committed to net zero by 2050. We've got to figure out how we're going to get there. We've got to, uh, you know, the, the climate, we need this for the climate. We are at the cusp in this sector, we would argue, which is it contributes a major proportion of our greenhouse gas emissions in this country and actually in, indeed impacts urban sprawl, our manufacturing, how many cars we're building, which is a lot of greenhouse gas emissions in making those vehicles, et cetera. We could, um, we, you know, these kinds of transformative, transformative changes are the only way that we are going to actually achieve our, our net zero energy future. Uh, we would argue that uh, we need to be thinking very clearly about what kind of a future we want to build. We're not talking about predicting the future, we're talking about making it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, David. That was, um, I think, an extremely uh, insightful uh, talk. Uh, we do have some questions here. I know we've got some questions on the chat and we've got some questions uh, here in the boardroom where we're kind of running mission control here. Um, first of all, from the chat, uh, we've got, um, so how are digital communications managed in bad weather, um, you know, can consideration of things like salt and sand on vehicles snow and ice build up and, and the like. Has that been something that's been kind of considered at this point? Actually, that's a really good question because, of course, a lot of the autonomous vehicle movement is uh, is uh, going on in um, in in more uh, better climes, if you like, than in Canada. There is some work, and uh, University of Waterloo is doing some on, on, and certainly I know some in Alberta as well, where people are trying to develop um, uh, technologies uh, that are, can can actually get through some of those. Um, there's some pretty sophisticated things being done now, certainly uh, some technologies that can actually, uh, you know, see through snow and, uh, you know, that kind of things. And, uh, you know, certainly um, uh, a lot of uh, much, very much improved GPS technologies that, you know, give you a, a very precise locations. Um, there's, um, I think that there, you know, obviously it's going to be later this you know, this coming down into the Canadian uh, situation. Um, I'm not convinced that this is going, that, I mean, it's going to be a challenge, but it's, I don't think it's a, something that is um, insurmountable. Certainly now, when you think about the way things work now, basically we have um, people who, you know, are driving cars in the snow and uh, there's, you know, protocols that we use and, and things. What will happen in a digital future is cars will talk to each other. Uh, and basically say, you know, the two cars are approaching each other on a narrow road. Uh, you know, there's maybe snow banks on the side and basically they'll have some sort of a algorithm that will determine who goes first, right? And one will pull aside, the other one will go through. And they'll, whereas now we do it by, um, you know, it's, it's, it happens now. It just happens between two people looking at each other and so, you know, figuring out somebody uh, gives up, you know, pulls aside or something and, is is polite. Um, we're we're going to obviously you can. I I think that there are protocols that can be developed and and are being developed to to address this. I don't think it's a game stopper. It's going to slow us up a bit relative to say uh, deployment in California. Uh, Dave, just going a little granular from what you've just said is uh, so understand the um, some of the controls and transmitters will be on the vehicles, but will there be uh, Required investment by government on roads, lighting, things of that nature to help fulfill this? And then if so, who, who ends up paying for that uh, infrastructure cost? I think that's a really important question. And certainly it's a discussion that we have with governments when we've been talking to them about this space. <coughs> um, there's a uh, certainly lots of evidence of um, 
uh, you know, there's there's the infrastructure. The we talked about the vehicle to infrastructure communication. In the uh, in some of the research that we've talked to, and I'm not an expert on this. There are you know a lot of engineers that are doing tons of work in this space. Uh, they're talking about in cities in particular, uh, you know, sensors essentially or, or uh, communications uh, 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 every block or so in a city that'll be on a street post that will be basically it's part of the 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 five G the deployment of 5G uh, network. And um, and so certainly the, the build out of the 5G network is absolutely uh, critical for the deployment of uh, the AMOD technologies, the communications, where you get very much higher speed uh, connections and the ability to have, um, uh, you know, very regional technical details on, on what's happening in each block and, you know, sort of giving information about that, that should increase safety and uh, and uh, and actually reduce costs uh, overall. In terms of the cost, the current cost uh, if, of our gas taxes today, and moving, this is going to be a, a big issue that we need to be thinking about as we deploy this. And and one of the things we're interested in within wearing the accelerator hat is we'd like to talk to researchers who are interested, um, for example, in developing some new uh, uh, ways of actually collecting. Uh, a gas tax equivalent, um, uh, and we actually think uh, what I think that the future is going to to hold is as we move from um, gas vehicles where we put a tax on gasoline to uh, on every liter of gas you buy you pay a tax and that goes towards infrastructure in Canada for road infrastructure. Um, in the future with electric vehicles, it's going to be harder to collect that. It may be impossible to collect that tax with uh, electric vehicles, for example. And and so my guess is, but every we have ability now that every car can have a GPS. It should be tied to every license plate of every car. That there is a, a GPS uh, software that once a week it just updates and reports how many hours and what time of day you drove on this type of road or that type of road, and you'll get a weekly bill or a monthly bill that basically says this is your road tax. It's uh, we calculated as about the gas tax is about three cents a kilometer per vehicle. Um, uh, if you paid five cents a kilometer per vehicle, which should be possible if we, in the transition, the, the cost savings for, for person mobility will be greater. We're going to have more kilometers. Um, if you went to about five cents a kilometer, we could basically pay for the infrastructure, uh, you know, and be as we're at 800 billion kilometers a year or something. I mean, it's like a it's incredible number of kilometers per year. Uh, we've got the numbers. I shouldn't quote that number unless I check it. But it's uh, uh, the, uh, being traveled on our highways, and um, you know what? By putting a uh, putting a price per kilometer, so it's every road is a toll road. What? Um, and I think that's really what we need in the future as we look forward uh, to to making sure that we have the funds to not only maintain the roads but maintain the the digital infrastructure. Uh, and it's it's only makes sense that this is paid for. Um, we are talking about a lower cost personal mobility system, significantly lower costs. The time to think about is how do we build in to make sure that, uh, you know, that this doesn't uh, become a burden on taxpayers because they're actually getting a break. Okay. Hi, Soro here. Uh, so I have a question about the infrastructures, uh, the highways we have in Canada, the inner city roads we have. Do you think we are ready for it or how long? Do you think it will take for us to make it ready for a road vehicle? I think it's going to take some changes. The big challenges, I think, and uh, this needs more research, right? I, I'm not. Let's be honest. I am not the expert on this. Um, what we've tried to do within the accelerator is a, as an interdisciplinary type of person. What I'm trying to look at is, is coming at this from the perspective of. How do we? Um, what are the uh, disruptive forces that we could be harnessing to take us to a low carbon future? To take us to uh, better cities, uh, a better Canada, if you like. We see this as a really important one. I don't have the answers. I got more questions than I have answers. But I think that do we have the roads? I think in some ways we're, we're going to see need, need to see changes. There is a possibility of having um, when you have autonomous vehicles. There is a possibility of actually having um, narrower highways, where or, or narrower lanes, because these these vehicles can, you know, you can be be tighter. Um, you could have uh, the vehicles packed more closely together, right? 
um, about right sizing of vehicles. You can have vehicles that are only a half a vehicle wide, right? And you're a one person vehicle. In fact, about 80% of all of our travel on the roads today is, is a single person in a car. If we actually had uh, uh, mobility as a, you know as a, a, a AMOD system where their fleets, a lot of the vehicles may only have one person in it and a little bit of storage space, right? For space for your briefcase or backpack or whatever, um, or for groceries. Uh, the question is that you know what we we are going to have to rethink our infrastructure needs. I think one of the things that will happen is that a whole lot of our infrastructure around our road system is about parking. Uh, we make our roads wider so that we can have parking spots. If we actually got rid of street parking, right, you have a room for bicycle lanes. You have a room for more walkable communities. And and what, what you're taking is street parking away. And my sense is that in some ways we have, we're going to have a luxury of space in some, some places and we're going to be rethinking, need to rethink pick up and drop off locations for uh, you know, for grocery stores and shopping malls. Uh, how do you do that? Um, uh, you know, at, at our at our um, train stations for urban transit, for, for public transit, instead of these large parking lots around all of the, you know, um, uh, train stations, um, what you have is a, is a whole grunt bunch of pickup and drop off locations, right? For, for, and people won't need to, they'll be picked up their house, they'll be taken to the train station, they'll dropped off really close and then get onto the train. Those are the, we need to be rethinking those. We, um, I think it's a really important question. As a, as a society thinking about transforming our energy systems, we actually have to stop only putting our energy, energy system, we need to be transforming our systems. And thinking about what is going to make a better system will make it easier for us to transfer to a low carbon economy by embedding, uh, thinking bigger, making the problem bigger. Dave, I, 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 it's my understanding there's some communities in the states that are taking on this activity or some action like this. Is yes. there anything in Canada where, because I'm, I'm thinking that the way to approving this and improving it fast is to pick a particular area, city, region, and doing the full testing. Is there anything like that being discussed in Canada? What I think there's tons of discussions. Every major city that I know of is talking about doing pilots in this area. Um, some of them have already, you know, there have been some small pilots have been done in Calgary and Edmonton. I understand there's a pilot that is starting up in Toronto and one in Montreal, but I'm not, I don't have enough details about it. Again, I'm not the expert on this. I'm basically trying to say from a climate change perspective, we need we, we need experts to be really engaged. So um, I think you're asking, uh, I mean, I think there has to be, and one of the things we're looking at trying to do in the transition accelerator is actually trying to provide um, the funding and the academic expertise to inform these pilots to make sure we aren't doing pilots that are gonna create a problem in the future. Let's think forward about, uh, you know, typically society, in our policies, is society, um, you know, we we don't fix problems before they happen. We we basically wait till the the problem happens and then we try to fix it, right? We're actually arguing is that in this this um, we live in a time of very disruptive change now. We're trying to get uh, industry, governments, and academics to think together about how we actually think ahead before we take these uh, transformative technology and just let them develop in their own way. Let's actually direct the disruption. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, I think we just have, I know we're kind of running up really close to uh, two o'clock, but I think we'll maybe have one more question uh, just from uh, Saurabh here uh, in the boardroom. Uh, hi, David. Uh, the Ooh. assumption of the charging stations, so if when we own electric vehicle and we charge in our houses, the charging stations are decentralized. But when the big corporations own the vehicles and they charge them in one place, uh, that is centralized charging stations. So that becomes less resilient or more vulnerable. Uh, so uh, 
they can be affected by any kind of force majeure like natural disaster or terrorist attack or anything. So are we doing anything or thinking anything about that? I, actually, I do know there's a few studies that we've, uh, I'm actually on a PhD committee of, of somebody who's trying to address issues around uh, disruption and, and, and security supply with electric. I think what we might find when you look forward at, at these technologies being deployed, that we might actually go, there, there is a pretty strong business case that's emerging uh, because it takes so long to charge vehicles and the turnover and the having the, keeping the vehicles on the road is going to be very important we might find that we move to hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, for some of these fleets. Not necessarily all of them, but, but certainly some of them. Uh, in terms of uh, the charging stations, I think the issue, I don't see that being one charging station, I'd see every company would have its own charging uh, station or maybe multiple ones at different parts of the city. So you aren't having to drive, you know, in the bigger cities, there would be still tons of, of you know, uh, uh, it could be a future for underground parking garages, you know, where you're basically, you know, because what, what happens to all these parking garages in cities, you know, they could just become, uh, you know, autonomous vehicle fleets where they charge underneath the building, the waste heat goes up and heats the building. I mean, we have to be thinking what, what is, as we move in the next 30 years, we're going to be seeing massive changes, I would argue. Next. We need, we need people to think and answer those kinds of questions. Uh, and and my, my sense is that, um, we need to find solutions. Obviously, we want something that's resilient, but also um, there's a pretty big cost uh, saving opportunity in what we're talking about here and convenience opportunity. And, you know, I think we need those discussions going on. I don't have the answers, though. Okay, thank you uh, very much. I know that that, uh, you know, I think it's still a conversation that does need to be continued for sure. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I found your definitely a lot of great info today, and uh, thank you very much, David, for um, for presenting this today. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, we look forward to hopefully having you speak again in the in the future. Um, as with uh, our other um, webinars that we've been uh, running here at 360 uh, in the past little while, we will have this up uh, and available on our website, a recording of this webinar. So. Um, yeah, feel free, um, you know, to check that out. Uh, we will have it available um, in the next uh, few days. Uh, we also will have um, some additional webinars coming up um, in the coming months, so please do uh, keep an eye out for those uh, those as well. I, in fact, I, I want to be, make people aware there's something being planned for uh, March 24th, John Pooley from the UK. We'll be talking about the status of uh, zero emission or net uh, of zero emissions and what that means to businesses in the future and how they need to be prepared for that. So we'll look forward to uh, see people at that session as well. All right. So without any, any further ado, thanks very much for everybody for attending. And uh, again, thanks very much, David. And uh, we look forward to talking and hearing you talk again. Thank you very much. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too.